I know that. I remember that. <laughs> but I thought it was pretty historic, though, nonetheless. Okay, we just kind of look at the back of the booster shot. At the top of your website, it says Tom Steyer, outsider taking on Trump. I understand that the idea of an outsider plays well with, with voters. Uh, but, but what's so great about being an outsider? Shouldn't a, a president have experience in government, in legislating, in, in running a state? Is, is this really a field where, where someone can walk in without government experience and, and do the job on day one? Well, if you think that the problem is that the government has failed, that it's been purchased by corporations, and in order to get any of the progressive policies that people talk about on the debate stage to happen, that we're actually going to have to break corporate control of the government. Actually, being an outsider means you're not wedded to the to, to the status quo. That you're willing to make changes. That y you are not reluctant. And I think if you look at the way people are thinking about this, that's true. That it, the things that I've proposed, other people won't talk about. And you can, uh, one of the things I talk about is term limits for Congress people and senators, which no one else will even respond to. And I think if you look at my ex experience in terms of grassroots in California and outside California, I have over a 10 year commitment to building power at the local level, pushing power down to the people. That's really what Need to Impeach was about. But also the idea that. Um, the actual wisdom in the United States resides with the American people, not with the elected officials. Well, and so oh, that's a okay. very, so when you think about change, that's a very, that's a very different attitude towards change. Can we talk a little bit more about the economy? Yeah. Um, as you noted, the president's going to run on the economy. To what uh, degree does a president affect the economy? And second, um, how would you, as president, do things in a way that would affect the economy and yeah. end up with a better result than we have now. Yes. So I think the president does a lot to affect the economy. I think it's a question, and I don't mean to be a snoot about this again, how you define the economy. So, so let's talk about this, because I think I define this very differently from the way Mr. Trump defines it. So if, you, if I were to define how Mr. Trump thinks about the economy, I'd say he probably looks at GDP growth, unemployment rates, and... S&P 500. Yeah, that's right. Those are the three things he quotes. I, those are not the things I care about, just to be clear. It's not that I don't care about them, it's just that doesn't tell the whole story. And if you focus on those three things, then you get the last 40 years, which is 90% of Americans not getting a raise, all the money going to the richest people, and really kind of a desperately unfair and unequal America. So let's talk about GDP. It's an average, I mean, it's a gross number with an assumption that it matters because an assumption that prosperity is shared somehow, somewhat evenly, right? Because why else would we care? If one person got all the GDP grains, would we care if 320 million people didn't? Wouldn't be a successful country. And I know that that's the absurd description, but it's not that, far, that absurd. So when you think about GDP, if you're not thinking about dis how it gets dispersed and shared, you're not accurate. Let's talk about unemployment. Okay, we have a really low unemployment rate. We do. And you guys live in Los Angeles, California. You know people can't live on the jobs they have. That's why people have two jobs. That's why people can't afford their rent. That's why people, you know, there is a question here about whether unemployment is a fair number by itself, given how little people get paid relatively to how much things cost. And the, and the stock market. Look. I'm sure you guys saw this. There was a Washington Post story probably two weeks ago, I'm going to guess, about the tax rate paid by the 400 largest American corporations, 11%. It's like, yeah, we have a booming S&P. If you run the country for corporations and cut their taxes in half, it turns out they, their stocks go up. Okay. Now, that's something that overwhelmingly helps rich people or upper income people doesn't help half of America at all, but is way disproportionate. So when I look at America, I look at also how the money gets dispersed, what kind of wages people are paid, what kind of mobility exists in the United States, what kind of productivity we're creating, what kind of capability we're creating in American citizens going forward. 
that my idea of prosperity is Americans becoming more productive, more capable for the future so that all the time we're building the ability of broad-based prosperity led by American people. Completely different way of thinking about prosperity. Well, you mentioned um, declaring a, a climate national emergency. How do you see that taking shape, and what do you think as a president you can do under a national emergency? I know. To get Look, I've looked at it. I think the I kinds of, <laughs> the kinds of, <laughs> curse really. um, the kinds of things I think you can do is I think you can basically set up the equivalent of renewable portfolio standards. I think you can set up the, ability, the equivalent of building codes. I think you can set up the kind of standards of what kind of cars get produced on a national basis. And I think that it's got to happen. It's got to happen on an expedited fashion. Isn't it too late? I mean, you mentioned on your website. Um, too late. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> talk, about, talk about car standards. 100% um, EVs. EV, yeah, by 2030. Uh, so a car in 2029 that's sold will be on the road for 12 to 15 years. I know. I mean, and this is that puts us well beyond what all the scientists are telling us is is. Look, if you look. <laughs> well, let me say this. If your point is, Tom, you're the person who has his, his number one priority, is the most aggressive on this in terms of timing and outcome, and you're not being tough enough, I would say you're probably right. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, but look, I mean, it's not like we're going to say you produce what you produce now, and then in 2030 it goes to zero. Right. I mean, obviously it's that. Right. 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 But let me say something else. Look, it is funny as a California, as somebody, and I follow the science, but I assume you guys have followed the science too. The science sucks. The facts on the science, I was literally in the car coming over here and reading about Australia. And I don't know if you've been following Australia. And this is the beginning of their fire season. And the stories are horrific. So in answer to your question, a state of emergency. It is a state of emergency. I mean, people keep saying, like, state of emergency? That seems pretty dire. It's like, OK, first of all, it is a state of emergency. There's Second of all, there, what is the chance? This is a global problem. What is the chance that the United States can lead the world in solving this problem if we aren't solving the problem at home in an urgent fashion? 